Hare Krishna Yogeshwar Pro. Welcome back once again to the Monks podcast. Thank you. Glad to be back with you. Thank you very much. Yes. So Prabhu, today I thought we could discuss on a theme that we had addressed briefly in our previous podcast about you know the extent the 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 limits of technology not just tech, the moral limits of technology not just in what some technology can do but what technology should or should not do when technology starts playing god so <clears throat> now this came up this comes up from various directions but uh, one key direction is uh, at this point uh, there are attempts say for example to decide you know when life should begin or when life should end so not just when but how like there are designer there that ideas of designer babies and that is associated with eugenics which is quite a which had a quite a horrendous connotation during the uh, nazi history and there is idea also of you know assisted ending of life you could say Uh, but when is that legal when when is that desirable when is that not desirable i i read in germany they have made it like a cons- fundamental right for a person to die so earlier it was only when a person has a terminal disease uh, and it's incurable then they can die but here now the rule is that if a person desires to end their life they they see a psych- psychologist and if they say that yes this person has a desire to end their life and then the the same government which is devoting resources to prevent suicide and now also provides resources to a person who is perfectly healthy otherwise uh, to end their life so where exactly do we draw the limits for technology and how what do our vedic what do our bhakti texts say about this it's a big issue but maybe you can start with how you would like to address it and then we can take it forward uh I agreed to discuss this topic with you Prabhu not because I'm a scientist you know I I know about as much as technology as you know about belly dancing you know I'm, I'm not a scientist yes but I totally agree I think you know this is this is sometimes I feel sorry to interrupt you but this is I feel a issue where it's not so much of uh we are discussing more the not the technicalities of science but the scope of science correct because there is correct. science and there is scientism which uh, which places almost an aura of omnipotent omni, omniscience around science right. so yeah thank you for clarifying that but well but that said i mean you know to to have this conversation we do need to put science and technology into some context otherwise we won't be starting from the same uh, point that of origination so some discussion about it is is necessary but i think the value of this discussion uh, as you've intimated here is that it does concern us as devotees as as concerned citizens of a broader world you know we move forward in our devotional life not moved by neurological systems but by ethical and moral and spiritual system and the implications as you've been indicating for that larger society with respect to technology and what it can do and what it should be allowed to do um are quite dramatic and they do concern us this is my point you can say well that's not our business you know within a the devotee community our business is you know uh, strictly krishna consciousness and the fundamentals of devotional service and these issues whether they be politics or technology whatever it may be uh those don't concern us well i disagree i think they do i i i mean why did the acharyas bother writing books if they did not have a view toward the future of humanity so beautiful thought we have we have to have some concern because if technology technology runs away from us <laughs> what kind of future will there be so what 
what is our responsibility toward the future, not just ourselves of today, but also the implications of the developments within technology for tomorrow. So there are a number of issues like this that, that uh, deserve our attention, but let, for the sake of sh sharing a certain a starting point of information with your listeners, your viewers, why don't we just put this in some context that you know this is uh, technology is not new. I mean, uh, okay, Leonardo right. designing flying machines back in the 1480s when Mahaprabhu <laughs> first appeared on the planet. <laughs> So there, it, it's not a, a new idea. Um, but coming closer, if you go to, uh, let's say, World War II and the dawn of the atomic age, 1945. Now, what we see is this giant leap in technology where anthropocentric anthropocentric inter intervention, human intervention, can affect the future of things through our technology. It may be, for example, that the future of Kali Yuga, as it's described in Srimad Bhagavatam, will not be an Adi Daivik re result effect. It, it may be Adi Bhotik. It may be anthropocentric. It may be that we ourselves will be the cause of the kind of description of this apocalyptic future in Kali Yuga that we read about in Bhagavatam. That's not made clear from the text, but it is, I believe, a possibility. We're seeing already the deterioration in environment and in, in, in climate and so on has a human point of origin. Mm. And so there is I believe this broader context for our conversation, that's an important one. And I do believe that it, it concerns us as devotees. So that, that's, I think, a, a good starting point for us in this. Okay. In this yes, please. So I like this point, especially that the Acharyas wrote books for the future. Because in one sense, they had a reach at that particular time and through the oral tradition. But books are for posterity. So what, if I understand what you're saying is that a broader concern beyond what immediately concerns us is, is an intrinsic, intrinsic characteristic of our tradition. So when, so, so that broader concern can be in terms of the society, broader human society at present, it can be the human society in the future. And eventually tech, even if we stay aloof from some of these technological advancements, but they will intrude into our lives sooner or later. Because we are not, we as a devotee community are not living entirely isolated from the world. We are not an insular community in that sense. So I appreciate this point of, because it concerns us and our, so it, both ways it will intrude into our life. And a part of our tradition is to show the relevance of our tradition to say contemporary and futuristic issues. So I think both perspectives are important. Now, I thought of broadly three things, you know, that there are uh, three categories of say, you, as you say, anthropocentric or human intervention. So there are some things which are, which are constructive, some things which are destructive and some things which are more ambiguous. Now, of course, the constructive things may also have some destructive consequences. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, when the when we started using automobiles, we didn't really think that it was going to lead to climate lead to climate change. But there are some things which are broadly we can say constructive. You now, having electricity, air conditioning, and let's say some kind of uh, temperature regulation that helps us to survive in extreme weather conditions. So that's we could say some things are broadly constructive. So in that sense, also. We are intervening with nature, but in a way that is broadly helping humanity. So is that also playing God and is it playing it in the constructive, is it playing it in a healthy way? Then there's something which is destructive. Say, for example, as you mentioned, weapons of mass destruction. Now, sometimes the destructive may also have some positive results. 
in the sense that uh, now many parts of the world are trying to use nuclear energy and relatively speaking they say it is more eco friendly than fossil fuels and others of course to categorize when nuclear energy is being used for peaceful and violent purposes that may not be that easy but the point is that so in principle uh, when we start using technology to try to modify the world around us is that itself uh undesirable or is is it the way it is used the extent to which it is used that's what makes it undesirable uh, I, 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 th- i think i think the question is slightly misleading the, the the situation here is that this is inevitable whether whether we think it's uh morally ethically justified whether we've gone too far not too far the reality is it's here and it's real and the question is how are we going to deal with it the, the 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 challenge is that it's not the technology it, it's the culture around the technology you now we, we've allowed ourselves from a scientific perspective to outstrip our evolution morally and spiritually we've we've started from certain assumptions the assumptions are that more is better fast is better deeper is better uh uh, uh, uh farther is better and uh it's because of if you take a step back the image we have of ourselves as living beings if the image you have of yourself as a living being is that this life is what i have therefore let me maximize the um utility the happiness the pleasures of this life all the effort is going to be geared toward that utilitarian goal optimizing those goals mm. in fact part of the issue in artificial intelligence for example the big challenge when when you go into broadening from the specificity of artificial intelligence which is much more limited to artificial general intelligence which where it really begins to imitate brain functions is what's called the problem of alignment the alignment issue is how do you align machines with the the human notions of greatest good you know the the risks that you see hollywood of course exaggerates this mm-hmm. when when machines override their own uh uh limiting functions and rules because they decide that if i'm going to achieve the greatest good for the greatest number i have to kill this person i have to kill that person i have to yeah. take over this country i have to drop this atomic bomb so there's different scenarios where the uh, agi artificial general intelligence outstrips um the restraints that human beings have imposed on them uh if we take a step back and 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 this is of course the great contribution of of krishna consciousness of the acharyas of our guru varga of of, of shastra is that we know we're we're not this one lifetime is not everything this lifetime is a blip <laughs> it's one frame in this extremely long film strip of of it, of lifetimes now we have something that can guide our efforts theoretically so we have a great responsibility this is why i say this is an important conversation because what it does is expand the the, the dialogue around the, the 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 mission of krishna consciousness in the world away from the specificity of what we have known as identifiable devotional service you know, worshiping the deity book distribution 16 rounds studying scripture chanting the holy names the prashadam these are all the basics they always have to be there but that cannot be the extent of prabhupada's mission he didn't come here just to create monastic cells he came to create a spiritual revolution in society and that spiritual revolution is not anti technological it's anti material anything can be used in devotional service i mean that was the great contribution of bhakti siddhanta saraswati goswami maharaj 
he wore watches, traveled in cars, sent sannyasis overseas, broke all of those mm. old traditions with technology in the service of Krishna. This is Rupa Goswami Yukta Vairagya. We have no problem with technology. But what is the ethos that guides the use of that technology, the development of that technology, the deployment of that technology? That's where Krishna consciousness has, has a role to play. Hmm. You know, I appreciate this point that before we get into specific issues, the the culture around technology that's a very important point and the ethos so now but that itself brings us to so are we discussing this from a devotional perspective or for devotees because there is a starting presumption that this life is just one life and uh, or whether this life is a, as one phase over a multi life journey so we could say that this is like a axiomatic truth that we accept that this is what our tradition's wisdom brings in. Because if that premise itself is not acceptable to the technologically uh, infatuated mind or not, I don't want to use the infatuated negative sense, but if that premise itself is not acceptable to most people in society today, then uh, to what extent can we engage with and contribute uh, to that discussion. Uh, in other words, let me see if I can rephrase your question. If people don't embrace the Krishna conscious point of view, do we still have something to offer them with regard to limits or uh, not of technology? Am I understanding your question? Yeah, I would say the Krishna conscious point of view has many aspects, but the understanding of the self as as going through multiple lifetimes. So I would say that that in Krishna conscious perspective, there is ultimate Krishna is Krishna is God, the all attractive vision of God. If we consider like a pyramid, the idea that a bluish black, bluish black cowherd boy is God, that is a little more difficult for people to accept. The idea that that the there is essential self that goes over multiple lifetimes that may, may have a little broader acceptance. The idea, even broader, we can say that you know, life has a spiritual, life needs to have a spiritual purpose or life needs to be, life needs to have meaning which comes primarily from say ethical and spiritual side. That, that, that we could say have a much more broader, uh, broader acceptance. Yeah, so, okay. I see. Look, I mean, it, essentially, you're asking what what are the arguments that will be most compelling for uh, getting people to reflect on the appropriate and inappropriate uses of technology. Right? In a sense, I think you're asking the question. Where people will be most responsive is when it affects them personally. Yes. So, you know, you go like 1995, for example, in Australia, there was um, an inadvertent unleashing of a virus that killed something like 30 million rabbits, you know, from a laboratory. Uh, the pandemic we're confronting today, um, if people think that it's threatening, it's life-threatening, well, the, they're more likely to pay attention than if it's uh, just a theoretical issue about whether there's a self that transcends death. Okay. So that's that's understood, um, but it 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 may be that we're look ho Hollywood doesn't help, right? You know the, the you know the Terminator image of of um, you know cyborg uh, um, you know soldier armies and 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 uh, uh, you know these kind of uh, uh, human machine. Uh, 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 hybrids that uh, yeah star wars is filled with that star trek has it and then sure they almost you know, have almost entirely human characteristics but they are largely science science fantasy, science fantasy. Or, you know movies like uh, her with Joaquin phoenix or or ex machina um you know and 
you know, I mean, first of all, they get the science totally wrong. It's, it's, they're, they're ridiculous from that perspective. But um, and they're but they're movies, right? So they're engaging and they raise uh, certain issues uh, for discussion. So it, <laughs> ironically, it may just be that the technology of entertainment is uh, a, 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 an effective entry point for discussion about the higher issues of technology. Okay. Because it's it's entertaining, you know. People are aware of issues not because they've studied the implications from a an ecological, environmental perspective, but because they saw a movie or a television show, and, and they go, "Oh yeah, I remember <laughs> that yeah. was interesting." So let's talk about that. So you know, in, in that sense, that may be a way in for people. And you know, when the Matrix came out, yeah, Matrix was. I mean, and there are yeah. a lot of, I think, a lot of relevant things in Matrix as compared to, yeah. sure, yeah, you know, the the whole idea that we're asleep, you know, in 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 a, in, a, in a kind of material machine, and and that if we wake up to our true self and so on, uh, I don't know where the Wachowski brothers got all their ideas, but it, it wouldn't surprise me if they were reading something from the Vedas. Um, and I remember, for example. Uh, even before I became a devotee as an 18 year old in 1968, when uh, 2001 first appeared in movie houses, it was fascinating. You know, the idea of uh, a sentient machine, you know, overriding human orders for its own notion of what is a more important goal or objective. I mean, it, so it was extraordinary at the time. Today, you fall asleep. The movie's so slow. You <laughs> can't watch it anymore. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, you know, our, our own thinking has, uh, has evolved over time. But, the, the, you know, the, the meta dialogue here, the, the larger dialogue, um, it is important and can be made interesting. I think this, maybe this is the best answer I can give you as we talk about this spontaneously, it is our, that's precisely our responsibility, isn't it? That's our job now, is to find a way to take Prabhupada's teachings, the traditional teachings, and evolve a new language, a new vocabulary, new phrasings, new wordings, new concepts, new modalities of expression, so that the essence of those teachings Makes sense to a scientific and technologically oriented society, which is why, for example, I was very honored recently when uh, the uh, people at the Bhakti Vedanta Institute in Gaines, Gainesville uh, asked if I would join their board. I, I, I was felt very honored that the Bhakti Vedanta Institute was arguably the most important project to Srila Prabhupada. He wanted to establish. On, a, on, on scientific terminology, I can't say scientific grounds, but scientific terminology, that there is a relationship, that, that, that the Vedic perspective, the notion of a transcendent self and non-material self, consciousness, not as a product of material wave functions and particles, but as something of a different order altogether, is defensible. There's that famous walk on Venice Beach, when he told the, the science disciples, our worship of Krishna, that's our own internal business. Mm. Your job is to present that consciousness is a non-material phenomenon. I'm paraphrasing. Mm. Yes. So that there, I think that's, that, that's not only a, a, a great responsibility, but that's exciting. That's amazing mm. that we have this opportunity. What an extraordinary thing. And we need to embrace it. Beautiful. So broadly, what you are saying is that with respect to this dialogue, rather than first determining the, uh, determining the limits of specific advances, so we can focus on the, as you said, what do we bring to this discussion? And what Prabhupada wanted us to is to take, take the take the message that he got from the tradition and see how it interacts with and how it addresses these issues. 
Yes, Prabhu. So, so if we accept the premise that, like as you said, consciousness is uh, consciousness is not simply a result of <clears throat> biochemical changes in the brain cells. So, if this understanding is there, you now how would that understanding mm, reflect? Uh, our technological pursuits or how would that understanding shape technological pursuits? Well, I'm going to answer you, but in, in, in an indirect way. Okay. Let's step back for a moment um, and look at where things are in, let's say, the world of artificial intelligence. Right now you have most of the progress has been made in what's called uh, narrow AI. Some, some people don't even like the, nerm, the term artificial. They say augmented intelligence. So it's, it's called in different ways. But um, a narrow AI is what most people are familiar with in your GPS and, uh, you know, uh, fast computations of very large numbers uh, that, that excel uh, um, the, the rate of, uh, of, of determining um, how to get through masses of data, you know, trillions of bits of data mm. in, in, in super fast time. The, the more exciting area I think for most people working in this in this area is, is, is as we were discussing artificial general intelligence, where things become more spontaneous. Um, I remember going to a, a by the way, I, I do recommend to those of your listeners or viewers who are interested in this subject that they go to worldsciencefestival.com. Um, my privilege is to have a, a very well-known brother a physicist, Brian Green, who has put together this extraordinary program called the World Science Festival. And if people are interested, there's thousands of uh, recorded uh, panel discussions and presentations and lectures. And, and all you have to do is in the search box, it's free. It's, it's absolutely free. Just search for artificial intelligence or, 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 or you know, black holes or whatever the particular interest that you have. So worldsciencefestival.com, good place to go. <laughs> Um, I remember, however, going to one of uh, the events of the World Science Festival, and there was a panel on stage, and it was um, mostly brain researchers. And they started, the, the, the subject of this panel was um, creativity and the brain. And they started with one of my uh, heroes in the world of modern dance, Bill T. Jones, phenomenal choreographer. And uh, Jones was invited to start this event by uh, creating a spontaneous dance for 60 seconds. So there was a cello and he would stay within a one foot square and did, and without repeating a position. So he went through 60 seconds of totally spontaneous, beautiful gestures and movements. And then the panel uh, discussion opened up and they were showing projections of uh, computer renderings of the brain when the brain has a creative idea. And then this part of the, you know, Abdullah opens up and this changes color over here, <laughs> all kinds of, and Bill Jones is on stage, he's like this, he's obviously very worried. And then he speaks up, he says, you know, I, I have a concern. My concern is that someday when we want to create a piece of music, when we want to create a dance, he, someone's going to sit down at a computer and they're going to knock something out and that will be considered creativity. He says, for me, the only way I can describe for you the sensation, the fulfillment that I feel when I'm on stage and I, and I dance is the word spiritual. And Prabhu, I have to tell you something. It was very embarrassing. What happened next was totally embarrassing. This panel of scientists did not even dignify him with a reply. They did not even bother to answer. They ignored him as if he wasn't there and had not said a word and just went on with their whole discussion about this lights up and these neurons. And, 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 and. it was so embarrassing. That now, of course, not all scientists are, are like that. Um, I remember another panel discussion where it was a discussion about consciousness. 
And there were brain researchers from Columbia University and elsewhere. Unfortunately, one or two of them were rather conceited. And, you know, one, one man who was very well known said, you know, for hundreds of years, we've always said we have a brain. It's taken us this long to understand finally that we are the brain. And he goes on and on and on. Oh, my God. And there, <laughs> and there was uh, one person on that panel who was um, a philosopher. And he said, I just have to ask you something. Does it really diminish us so much to, to admit that our intelligence has not evolved to the point where we actually understand what consciousness is? Are we not able to actually admit that we truly don't know yet? And again, dismissed as, as though he didn't make a point worth considering. I walked out, I have to tell you. It, so there is a certain kind of conceit that, you, that arises in the science community because technology has been doing such phenomenal things. The rate of acceleration over the past 70, 80 years is extraordinary. It's amazing. I mean, look, I, you know, I wear this Fitbit, you know. <laughs> hmm. There's more computational power in my Fitbit than in the entire NASA space operation that put Neil Armstrong on the moon. If you believe that we went to the moon, we're not going to get into that. But the entire 60s, in the entire 60s and 70s of, of, of the space program, there's more computational power in here. And most of that, the functioning of this watch is predicated on the behavior of electrons and subatomic particles that no one has ever seen. Hmm. We have to be willing to admit that that's some pretty impressive stuff. And, and you know, medicine, the developments in medicine. I mean, when, when devotees need an operation or they need medication to get healthy again, in those moments, we don't poo-poo science. Hmm. I, I think we need to make this distinction between science and technology as viable tools that can be engaged in devotional service. And the mentality which says we don't need a God, we're capable of coming up with the answers to our problems on our own. That's, that's the risky part there is when this hubris develops, this, this egotism that because we can evolve these technologies, that is therefore evidence that there is no non-material causality in the world, that it's all possible within the realm of matter. You know, the physicalist science perspective is the right one. That's, that's dangerous. That's, that's where you get all these, you know, uh, move, these, the, these, you know, man versus machine movies, you know, and man comes up on, <laughs> because the idea being that we, we have on our own the capabilities overcome any any hurdle any obstacle and that's dangerous in this week. yes bro i think that's a very significant difference between say using technology accepting the utility and value of technology for uh, for our functional and our own spiritual purposes and then thinking that technology will lead to the uh, will lead to the denial or rejection or, or using that technological advancement gives us the right to reject God. So there are very distinct uh, differences. Uh, having said that, you know, in the domain of technology, uh, what come in the domain of using technology, uh, what comprises, say, playing God? What so comprises? Example, playing God. Say, I, I read that say now we are almost so many of us use glasses. So when when glasses were developed for the first time, there there were uh, some religious teachers who said who said that you should not use them because you are interfering with the natural with, with the way nature nature goes through. So if nature is decreasing your eyesight, why interfere with nature? You have no right to interfere with nature. Now, today we would consider that 
that absurd but say in the in just a few maybe a few hundred years ago few 50 or 100 years ago you know we didn't have so many facilities for cpr where a person gets a cardiac arrest and person's heart stops working and then we use so many techniques for restoring their life so now this is that's why i said earlier it's like this is constructive constructive use so if by the body's own functioning the life is ending and then we use intervention to ensure that the body life does, that that the that the body is still a usable instrument for the soul so if that is that is a valid use of technology and say if we move forward when does the use of technology become become questionable as you said that when do we start uh, going from the role of using technology for say for maintaining our survival or increasing our our comfort in life or at least decreasing our discomfort to uh, when we start using technology to to usurping god or playing god uh, that's where the question comes up because it's it's a slippery slope i mean principle even within our tradition we had ayurveda so using means to enhance health or to 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 cure disease that is not at all anti technology that is not anti spiritual at all so earlier you said that things are that we are not anti technology till we are we are anti material which is a very important point but in terms of the deployment of technology when does it change or is when does the purpose change or is that something which is up to every individual's conscience uh, no, no. responsibly decide technology and science do not have a moral compass they do not yeah. have a, a, a spiritual or ethical compass they they're, yes, they're meant to be neutral in that regard they don't yeah. attempt scientists don't attempt to take a position on the um, correctness or the incorrectness of the use of what they find they say that's the realm of philosophers and religionists that's not our business our business is to figure out how this works So so you know the um the, the we're we're in an experimental period because the technologies that are emerging are forcing us to ask questions for example you mentioned earlier eugenics for example um we we still have certain respect for life for the sanctity of life but uh, when nazi germany as you rightly mentioned back in the 1930s and early 40s um instituted uh programs of uh, euthanasia of the murder of um people with genetic challenges mental uh, illnesses of different kind um they pointed to the united states for their role model the united states in the late 20s or 30s sanctioned uh lobotomies sterilizations uh uh, uh other forms of um uh, violations of the dignity of life under the uh the pretext of wanting to build a stronger saner safer society and those programs were endorsed by very high ranking people in science and government and education and uh today for example in legal circles there's a question about the introduction of um uh, artificial intelligent ai systems into the criminal justice uh, uh arena when is due process of law uh, uh compromised uh if evidence is being um aggregated through ai systems and the specificity of a crime is lost within those data and statistics um we we don't know the answers to these things uh it's 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 
a time when men and women of goodwill, and we, we need to acknowledge it. You know, the world out there is not populated by, you know, rakshasas and rakshasis. It's not. Let's, let's, let, let's calm down a little bit about these things. The world is comprised of decent, for the most part, men, and women, and children who wish to go about their lives. You know, they're, they're not looking to defeat God. They're not on some kind of a political platform to, uh, to prove the supremacy of science over religion or anything like that. There are some people who are uh, 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 strident and outspoken about these things. But for the most part, the world is, is filled with decent people who are looking for uh, basically handle, to handle their responsibilities, take care of their children, um, have at least a minimum decent quality of life. And um, I, why am I bothering to say all this? Because in our discussion about technology and the relationship of devotional life to the uh, constantly accelerating world around us. Um, I think we need to recall that our primary obligation is to be good examples. So that when we talk about these things, whether it's, you know, the role of the, the relationship of Krishna consciousness and science, or the the rights of women, um, people of other than binary sexual uh, positions in society, or whether it's races and 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 different communities, um, we are meant. We're attempting to be Vaishnavas. We're attempting to offer all respect to to others. How are we ever going to make advancement ourselves if we think ourselves better than anybody else? I don't see how that's possible. I remember Srila Prabhupada once, uh, a, a young man came to him with an idea. And he said, Srila Prabhupada, I have an idea for a book. And I want to call the book 108 Steps to Krishna Consciousness. Prabhupada hated the idea. <laughs> he said, no, 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 no. Krishna consciousness is not mechanical like that. That's interesting. I, I never knew that. So, <laughs> so you know, but that that's a good, I think that's a good metaphor, a good equivalent for our conversation here about technology. The starting point for us is character. The starting point for us is respect. The starting point for us is um, a level-headed, dispassionate assessment of options and opportunities in service to the Supreme Lord. Okay. So, mm, I mean, I appreciate what you have spoken and uh, I love this point about not uh, like seeking simplistic, like reducing spirituality down to simplistic steps. So spiritual wisdom, it is like a we all have to have a deep discussion or dialogue between uh, between uh, how our spirituality can affect us and our use of the resources in the world, including technology. But uh, say if we take specific issues, is there any? So I'll keep the discussion a little more open ended because I'm realizing that uh, focus like. Questions which are too focused on particular issues may not may elude quick answers. So, would you like to take any particular issue and uh, to illustrate, you know, how the how we can contribute based on our tradition something to the discussion around uh, the culture uh, uh, discussion about the ethos and culture of using technology. Yeah, I mean, we touched on it earlier, Prabhu, and uh, it's what I think we would, uh, what's called in in in, uh, in the intelligence uh, field, unaligned uh, intelligence. You know, when when uh, um, the the purposes of technology 
are not aligned with essential human values. I mean, they're, they're, you know, the people involved in these worlds are all warning us about it. You know, the Bill Gateses and the Elon Musks. Uh, you know, uh, Stephen Hawking once described that artificial intelligence is is either uh, the best of humanity or the worst of humanity. Uh, where we're in a position where we have this is an opportunity. Here. It's an opportunity um, to introduce guidelines for the future of science and technology. That, that's why I joined the BI board. I, I think it's critically important that somebody, who's going to do it? Who's going to offer those guys? I mean, yeah, there are departments in, in laboratories and in universities of called, you know, ethical uh, intelligence. Um, there are uh, officers whose job it is to uh, assess whether the applications of technology, even our, our god brother Brahmatirtha Prabhu in Gainesville, his job is to assess if an industry wishes to come in into an area, what will their environmental impact be? And his report will very often determine whether uh, a company is given a license to build factories or not build factories. So, you know, there are opportunities that we have if we ourselves are clear. And I, I think this is the point. There's an education. That's what we know. It's been what since since Srila Prabhupada came to America now. It's been what? How many years now? And we're we're at a very exciting time, very, very exciting time, where we're, you know, the the, the, the temples are there, the, the structures are there, the books are there, the infrastructure is evolving. Um, the, the, you know, the, the foundational tools are coming into place, the safeguards, child protection, whatever it may be. We have an opportunity now to go deeper. And I think this is what Prabhupada always wanted us to do, to penetrate deeper into the issues of society so that we can contribute something unique from our perspective. It has to do with the nature of consciousness, which you and I have talked about before. But with regard to this issue, of, of, of the future of technology and, and what are the limits? You know, where does something become um, counterproductive? Where does it become dangerous? The, the issue is who will offer that education so that those people who are involved in these fields have moorings, have a, 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 a structure, have, have a background architecture, an ethical and moral and spiritual architecture to work with them. That, I think, is, is the, the challenge in front of us. But the technology is, is uh, undeniable. Look, my son is an airlines pilot. 95% of the time that is in the air, his plane is on autopilot. <laughs> mm. So, I mean, whenever someone wants to go out on Harinam Sankirtan, they consult their GPS. You know, what's the best route to get? <laughs> It's a part of our lives, you know, it's just, it's not an irrelevant discussion, but I, what you're asking, I think is much more future oriented. You're saying, what are the limits? How do we know those limits? And I'm, I'm not sure that the answer lies within the technology itself. It's in the, the technology reflects its engineers. You have to, we have to remember this. Technology is dumb, you know, Artificial intelligence is not very intelligent. It's dumb. Yes. And the best that it can do is reflect the presets of its own engineers and designers. If you have engineers and designers who have been grounded in, in, in a spiritual education, in, in, in the wider context of what are the ultimate benefits of humanity, then we won't have to worry about the future of technology. The people working in those fields will monitor themselves. That's, I believe, where Srila Prabhupada's mission comes in. Yes, Yeah, of course, uh, it's quite clear that technology doesn't have the answers to uh, how technology is to be used. Einstein famously said that uh, we can talk about the uh, 
we can talk about the ethical foundations of science. We cannot talk about the scientific foundation of ethics. So that's very clear. So what if I understand right? What you are saying is that say, if this is a particular technology and we are going to use it, so rather than we specifically stating how the technology should be used or not used, we create a system or a structure for informing those who are developing and deploying deploying the technology and then they will be able to uh, they then they will be able to have more uh, ethically responsible usage of the technology well yes theoretically that that's that could be the program uh, it would require if i may devotees trained in these fields you know i'm I'm a layman, you know, you and I can have this conversation because I'm not attempting to represent the technology industry or the scientific establishment. I, I have no uh, degrees in any of that. Um, but what I do know from my field is that, for instance, um, Nazi Germany took their prisoner population counts inside the concentration camps using an early generation of IBM computers. People may not be aware of that, but the, the, the background to the Holocaust was scientifically designed, technologically executed. Yes, that's So, true. you know, we, we, we assume, you know, those of us here in America that dem democracy is always going to be there. We're accustomed to it. It's around us and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and that technology will always be contained within this frame of reference. Nazi Germany proved totally otherwise. So, you know, this isn't just theory. This, this is historically proven that without that moral compass, without that spiritual compass, compass it can lead to the most devastating um, of, of conclusions. So it's a serious subject. Um, and I, I'm, I believe we are seeing some good signs now within ISKCON, within the Vaishnav community, that people are beginning to take stock of the kind of a contribution we can make in these larger arenas. Beautiful. So when you say that you are seeing the signs, are you seeing the signs within our movement or you are seeing the signs? So our movement wanting to engage with these issues or are you also seeing signs within the mainstream world that they are becoming more open to uh, insights from spiritual traditions? Because the yeah. example that you gave earlier was, seemed to be they were quite dismissive about the idea of any spiritual inputs. So I don't think it's filtered down to a temple level yet. You know, in education, there are two things. It's called the systems level, and then there's the buildings level. <laughs> systems level means uh, a, an educational program that's implemented across uh, the a whole state, for example. Building level means that there is um, um, ancillary materials that each teacher in each building gets to choose. I don't think that this kind of a discussion is filtered down to the building level, if you will, the temple level within our society. Um, when Sadaputa was living in Gainesville, there was some of this going on there. Uh, uh, Bhakti Shurup Damodar Maharaj, of course, always spoke about this in his classes, um, but it's still pretty much limited to the various Bhakti Vedanta institutes around the world. The good news is that the, there's a growing community of devotee scientists, and there's an init initiative, one of the many initiatives that the BI in Gainesville has, um, uh, 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 implemented of um, outreach to devotee scientists around the world. So there's a kind of network that's beginning. And little by little, you have these networks forming into uh, colonies or, or unions of like-minded um, people in a certain field. So we, you know, we have physicians, devotee physicians, who are beginning to organize themselves. We have um, devotees working in chemistry, you know, devotee scientists working in uh, cosmology, you know, we have, and, and so these clusters are, are beginning to form and, and grow and uh, beginning to develop a kind of internal synergy 
among themselves. And that's that's critically important and that, that needs to be encouraged. Um, it's not yet on a systemic level, uh, I think, uh, uh, institution-wide. Um, we're still at a point where the institution is having to deal with the basics of protecting Prabhupada society, um, uh, making sure that there are uh, controls in place, financial and uh, 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 you know, behavioral and so on. So we're, even though we're 60 some odd years into this, going, going deeper into the areas that you always bring up, your programs are phenomenal. Th those have to happen on the level of the congregation. You know, if you look historically, the, the, the inroads that have been made by religious communities rarely get implemented by the clergy. The clergy are responsible for um, safeguarding the institution. You know, they have to make sure that liberals like me don't rock the boat too much and that the best practices from the past are being maintained and perpetuated. When you look for innovation, you look to the congregants. They have the liberty, the option, the opportunity, and the impetus to bring fresh blood, fresh ideas, fresh energies uh, into the community. So I think that's where we're going to see that. True. You know, I mean, it is very striking that in general, if you consider our whole tradition, reform has happened more at the sidelines than at the center. Bhakti Yuna Thakur himself was not uh, like a central part of the Gaudiya tradition. He was not born in it. He was not even initiated when he discovered the Gaudiya tradition. And it was he who brought in the dialogue with the Bhadraloka. And in one sense, he created a new future, a new trajectory into the future for our tradition. So Prabhupada is also not like a central leader in the Gaudiya Mat. And he, in one sense, now of course, around him, a whole tradition has been built. But so what you are saying is that it will be more individual devotees who may form, form say, I don't know, sister organizations or associated forums, what would be the right word, but they may come together and form, create some formal or informal structures. And then there will be this dialogue that will happen, this interaction that will happen at a, at a broader level. Yes. Uh, if there are devotee scientists out there among your listeners, viewers, I would encourage them to reach out to the BIHS, Bhakti Vedanta Institute for Higher Studies in Gainesville, uh, find out more about what they're doing, learn about the people working in your field with whom you can connect and maybe develop your own synergy. Um, and uh, don't wait for somebody upstairs to bless your effort. Just go do it. Just go do it. Just go take the initiative to get something started. That's how things move forward. You know, Prabhupada didn't wait for someone to say, okay, now you can, you just go do it. You know, And, and uh, of course, take advice from the senior devoted community. You can never go wrong with that. But um, where each of us called upon to issue, uh, and, and to, to engage with our own initiative in, in a life of devotion. And each of us have, has been given our particular skills, our particular uh, field of knowledge, our particular sphere of influence. And our job now is to go out and to make the most of those opportunities. That's amazing. So in one sense, uh, this, is, this is more of a, uh, oh, the right word for it. A deinstitutionalized or individualized application. So, you know, for example, just to, as I, I work with the Bhaktanand Hospital doctors, and they were discussing, they had a few of our the devotee leaders from other Gopinath the community. They we had a virtual meeting on discussing what should be the policy if somebody wants to, if they're not able to have a child, then can they use IVF? Can they? What all things can be done? What all things cannot be done? Sometimes in IVF, you know, the embryos are uh, created and they are harvested, and if one works, then others are destroyed. So, is that acceptable? So, the, these kind of issues. When now I tried to give some inputs, and other devotees also give some inputs. So, there were uh, the three things which I thought of at that time. One is 
that this requires both spiritual expertise and technical expertise and there has to be a deeper understanding of the issue based on a deep a serious discussion on this and then after that also when an understanding is arrived would there be like one universal understanding for the whole movement would we have say in future uh, committees that uh, our movement appoints maybe the gbc appoints and they say that this is our stand on this issue now for some issues maybe say consider abortion we may the moral ambiguity might not be there so much although in terms of sociological context certain factors may need to be considered but uh, so are you saying that the positions once individuals take initiative and then they engage into the dialogue then eventually there will be institutional positions on these issues or that is uh, something which may or may not happen oh boy uh i guess i should it's no better than to expect an easy ride when i come going some place with you in this conversation <laughs> so uh, sorry about that <laughs> so uh ultimately our relationship with the supreme lord is a very personal one and i i grow concerned when i think about institutions or governments um trying to infiltrate too deeply into an individual's private life. Um, my concern there is that it's very easy to cross the line into uh, uh, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, uh, dictatorships, um, and the risk there is uh, to strip away the very nature of devotional service itself which is a free offering of love from the heart so i grew very concerned you know when we enter into this particular territory about uh, should there be uh, institutional uh, 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 locked in stone guidelines I, i i don't know whether it's even possible uh, certain basic ideas perhaps of course Uh, always have to be there the foundations of our philosophy uh, are in, inviolable um but are they without exception i can't tell you that today i cannot say to you that uh, uh, everything is uh, is so absolute that it does not allow room for some exception i think we have seen over the course of um, history over the course of several hundred years that uh, Gaudiya Vaishnavism has proven itself flexible, has pl- proven itself adaptable according to the changing uh, circumstances of uh, the culture around us. You know, I used to have an office in the Empire State Building here in New York. The Empire is on the 52nd floor. And in the strong wind, you could actually feel the building swaying. Really? The, reason is, the reason is the architects, when they first designed the Empire State Building, recognize that if the steel pilings they used to support the core of the building were too rigid that in a strong wind they would snap and the building would collapse so there was built into the amalgam of materials a certain degree of flexibility in order to avoid that kind of risk the same is true within institutions if if you become too rigid it will it'll snap there has to be some degree of flexibility in order to allow for diverse populations in order to allow for uh, shifting circumstances changing issues and usages over time uh, that's also there in law also you know, law, law is codified but then law can evolve courts can evolve in their thinking everything evolves um that's the nature of progress it's, it's something that's in constant motion so i'd be very careful i'd be very wary of um arbitrary uh lock you know locked in stone uh you know tr- truth is it, it you know i don't get into trouble here truth is not a set of tablets passed down from on high without change truth is a living breathing experience 
that has many different dimensions to it. And um, I believe devotional character means being able to take a deep breath, step back away from our own convictions about something far enough to be able to consider that maybe other people have a, a, a different perspective from mine and it does not make them wrong. If we're ever going to see a strong, healthy Krishna conscious culture making its greatest contribution in the world, Prabhu, I don't think it's going to be by people insisting that we are right and other people are wrong. I don't think that's the way it's going to happen. I think it will happen by a maturing on our part that we were able to accept that my conviction is my conviction, and now I'm willing to step outside the parameters of my conviction far enough to listen with open ears to what other people have to say because they have their covenant with God just as I have covenant, my covenant with God. Beautiful. And this, when, when you think, saying this about truth is a living, breathing experience, at one level, it is, uh, the truth is not just a handed down set of, was it your tablets you used? Like in the Old Testament? Well, yeah, I mean, not, not so oblique reference to the Ten Commandments. Yeah, Ten Commandments. Moses came down from the mountain. <laughs> yeah. But the good news, the good news, of course, is that the commandments are infinitely uh, uh, um, uh, 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 unfolding. Yeah, they unfolding. Yeah. But that, that was a metaphor. No, no, I agree with you. Now, in our tradition also, <laughs> we have this principle that uh, Prabhupada quoted Dharmam to Bhagavad uh, Pranitam, Dharmam to Sakshat Bhagavad Pranitam, but then that Dharma comes from God, but then it's also Dharma se tattvam nihitam guhayam. Mahajano yinagata sapanta. The Dharma resides in the hearts of the great souls. That it resides in the deepest resources of the hearts. And how do we learn Dharma? By following in the footsteps of the great souls. So in that sense, that, that dynamic, that there is, as you said, there is there are some inviolable fundamentals. But then it's not that all, all aspects of living in the world are uh, locked in stone. So that, that dynamism is there within our tradition itself. So, yeah. yeah. So just to, uh, you can reflect that I was going to an ex example of this, but maybe you can con con continue first respond to the point. What you put me in mind of is um, what for me has been a guiding light in my own Christian consciousness. And that is that there's, there's a foundational dimension of Krishna consciousness, which is comfortable. We adapt a personality as devotees. We adapt the neck beads. We adapt the clothing. We adapt the festivals and the holidays. And we uh, be identify ourselves with a, a, a cultural milieu that is um, familiar, reassuring. I think that, that when, you're, when someone is ready to make some substantial progress in their spiritual life, you step outside that comfort zone. You enter into the more challenging issues, such as you are so good at raising in these podcasts, and you begin to exercise initiative so that you, as, as a unique, never to be duplicated, irreducible being, with your own unique relationship with the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna, begin to discover what that means. You begin to discover what it means to exercise that uniqueness as a servant of God because it's not a parroting of someone else's service. It's not simply doing what someone else is doing. It's very, very unique to each of us. And the only way we can come to know what is the nature of our unique love for God is by going out there and taking some risks, by stretching the envelope, by stepping outside our comfort zone and attempting to make that greater effort to do the one thing that is most pleasing to God <laughs> which is to bring knowledge of him into the larger world. 
Mm. That's why that verse was that yet you got the mom Guyam 18th chapter. Yeah, yeah. You know? If I love you, I want to do the thing that is most pleasing to you. And here's Krishna saying, if you really want to please me, get get up and get out there and and <laughs> and, and I've got other children who are you know suffering out there. Go bring them back to me. <laughs> so to do that, we have to understand what are our unique gifts. And, and that, that takes some effort. You can't do that staying at home all the time. Well, maybe these days. But okay. my, my point is that there, it, it's not without risk. That's my point. Yes, I agree fully. So that when we are offering now we are that we are all unique that i have understood but never to be duplicated personal relationship with krishna uh, that makes us that infuses us with a sense of you could say non egoistic spiritual significance sometimes we say humility means we are insignificant but at one at another level bhakti means that we are so significant that we all have a relationship with the lord each one of us has a personal relationship with the lord so now applying that so maybe i'll just take one issue uh, which may not be particularly controversial but uh, say nowadays artificial meat is being made where without using any animal products using uh, say vegetable products uh, substance is made which looks like meat which tastes like meat and uh, so would it be ethical or unethical to take that would it be a devotionally so should technology be used to make something like this now the purpose of this may not be primarily spiritual but it may be because there are people who are vegan and who there is that itself is a significant uh, is uh, an indication of some evolution of higher consciousness we are concerned about the life of an, about animals so if we say opposite now i'll i'll try to give both perspectives on this that ultimate one perspective would be that you know if it tastes like meat it looks like meat then it's going to remind you of meat and ultimately we don't want to eat meat so why eat something which reminds us of that that could be one way of looking at it <laughs> <laughs> why even encourage that why even why even support that the another way of looking at it could be that we say that you know yes if people are uh, not going to eat it if if we can stop the killing of animals by this and if in this way less bad karma happens then why why not and maybe it could act as a transition so people who are eating meat they stop eating meat by this and then eventually they may become more their consciousness may also become more receptive to spiritual truth so of course there can be I'll, I'll more many more pros and cons somebody may say that we don't know what are the long term health consequences of this and we are tampering with nature and we are unnecessarily getting into trouble but so if two devotees or uh, two devotionally engaged devotees who are engaged in society they come up with different perspectives one says don't eat this another says you know or another says don't eat it i won't eat it or i won't recommend people eating it and somebody says you know i won't object to people eating it and if situations force me in a, if situations constrain me where i have to i will not i'm not in principle opposed to eating it so would both be broadly compatible with bhakti now i'm just taking a specific issue but uh, i'm just trying to see how this could be applied if you would like well, to I, mean, I i love that whenever we talk you have very very specific issues that you want to get into and um uh, a very you know practical level uh, of application of our talks and that's very important of course i don't think we're going to come to any kind of uh, blanket uh, conclusion here today about about an issue such as this sure i think you you've laid out the the various perspectives quite well i mean it may not be for a devotee because after all if it tastes like meat why would you want to eat it anyway um but if it means that there will be less animal killing in society and and that people who still have the taste have an option that they don't have to in, be involved in killing animals and so on. i mean the important issue here is the discussion isn't it? 
it's not the outcome. It, it's the process. It, really? We're, we're at a time when stimulating these kinds of discussions, we finally have a chance to do that. We're, we're not, it's not 1968, 69, 70, 75, 80, 85. You know, we're, we're 2021 and we're finally at a point where we can begin exercising these uh, tools that we've been developing for things that have greater ramification, let's say, that can make a deeper impact on the wider culture. That's, that's the important thing. So whether the discussion that you just outlined hypothetically concludes one way or the other, maybe a question of what country you're in. You know, if you're in Argentina, where the number one uh, industry is, uh, is, is cow slaughter, that may be a different discussion than uh, if you're uh, in some place where, uh, you know, vegetarianism is more widespread. I, I don't know. That's very specific to the circumstances in which the discussion is taking place. The important thing is the discussion. My God. So it's very significant. So what you're saying is uh, in the 1960s, 70s, or even 80s, our purpose was more centered on conver conversion. Whereas, uh, so that's why the outcome was important. But now our purpose is more of, say, entering into the conversation itself. And then in that sense, becoming a part of the broader discourse in the world. So, so the process itself is important. So are you saying this is because our we as a movement have evolved or is it because the world has changed and that conversion kind of Outreach is not acceptable in today's world, or is it both? I, I, I don't think, think people have changed all that much. We're, we're, we're reaching a more mature stage, because we're getting older and grayer. You know, I used to be a redhead, not really. But the point is that we're getting older. And okay. hopefully we're getting a little bit smarter. So that, you know, if we're not going to just be attracting hippies and dropouts anymore, and we really want to reach a more intellectual audience, we have to have a firmer grasp of the issues and we have to be able to know how to engage in the dialogue about those issues. When people will take Krishna consciousness seriously is when they see that the exponents of Krishna consciousness have something intelligent to say. We're not gonna, you don't trick people <laughs> into becoming devotees. You know, that, 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 that doesn't work. For, we are not going to trick. What are the word you use? Trick or what? Yeah, trick people, you know, to to do something cunning that will force them to make a decision they didn't want to make to move into a temple or to start chanting. You know, there may be some trickery. Some uh, in the early days of the movement, we used to do all kinds of crazy things to get people to take a book because we had this conviction of they just touch the book, it'll help them, and so on and so forth. Well, that's all right. We made as many enemies as we did friends. Today, if we're going to make a significant contribution to, to, to an improvement, a spiritual reformation of the society, you can't do it by, by tricking people into buying a book. You have to, you have to be able to address issues. You, you have to be educated on those issues. You have to know what the themes are, what the challenges are. You have to be aware of the various solutions that are being proposed. And then when you're immersed in something, you can find what is that unique additional contribution that we can make for Krishna consciousness. That, that takes some effort. That's, you know, that's, that's the opportunity that we have now. This is a very amazing uh, thought because in the past, I used to write frequently on uh, for the back to God magazine on the column called Vedic Observer, which which address contemporary issues. And two of my books are on that theme: the timeless wisdom on current issues and things like that. But then over a period of time, I started feeling that there is nothing nothing definitive or conclusive that we are actually offering because these are such complicated issues. And I can also say in two thousand five. 
I was much more, uh, you could say, much more narrow-minded or much more presumptuous about the scope of uh, conclusiveness that we can offer to issues. Now, maybe some humility has come in, although there's much more. But then I started feeling that uh, if we are not offering anything definitive, then what is the point of engaging in those issues? But what you are saying is that the purpose of engaging in these issues is not so much to give a definitive or conclusive understanding about that issue, but it is to enter into the discourse. And by that, say people, if people's minds will open to what, who we are and what we represent. Uh, now you're talking. Now you're talking. When we just get off our high horses, you know, we know, you don't know, we're going to clue you in. And just start talking like normal human beings again. That, well, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? What do you do in your podcast? And you're open to a dialogue, right? And all of a sudden, we're approachable. You know, nobody can, nobody can identify with someone who's, who's so fixed in ultimate truth that, you know, who even wants to be with them? <laughs> it... Look, we're sometimes so preoccupied with being ideal Vaishnavas that we forget to be warm-blooded human beings. The, 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 real, the real preaching work, you really, what, what, what's good preaching work? Become somebody's friend. Let them feel that they can trust you, that, that, you're, that you're interesting to talk to, that you're actually concerned uh, by them, their life, you know, uh, that's, um, that's such a gift, that's such a gift, especially now, there are so many broken hearts out there, so many people suffering from loneliness, they could care less what your position is on technology and science and, and artificial meat, they could care less, but if you take the time to sit with them and say, how are you doing, is there something that you need? And uh, just just to be warm and, and friendly, they'll never forget you. And then maybe one day they might even ask, "What are those beads around you? <laughs> what what is this mad compulsion? You know, to it, it impose ourselves on people? I don't understand that. I don't understand it." You know, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was here, yes, he was a great scholar. He, he won people over, not so much by sophisticated Shastric references, which he did do, Prakashananda Saraswati, Sarvabhoma, and others, but because of the love in his heart. People were so thrilled just to be with him. And he, he, he loved everyone. You know, they felt that he cared for them. You know, there was this totally smitten, you know, total love of Mahaprabhu for the person he was. Prabhupada was the same way. Yes, he was strong and he was philosophical, but that's not the side of him that I remember so much. I remember this person who was, he cared for me. He cared for everyone. Um, he was humble. He was funny. You know, you can love a human being. You, you can't love a philosophy. You can love a human being. It's amazing. So, I'm, I mean, we have discussed this topic earlier about how the Prabhupada that captured the heart was the Prabhupada was loving. But I think bringing this issue, what you said about a mad compulsion to impose our view or others, you know, for many years, I would say that was my definition of preaching. Yes. <laughs> we were all brought up that way. You know. I mean, look, truth be told, Prabhupada was someone for everything. You know, he wanted to, it's, we're a missionary movement. Krishna consciousness is a missionary movement. There's no two ways about it. And there's nothing to be ashamed of in that at all. But it's more than just that kind of 
aggressive missionary quality. You can be a missionary and be very quiet, and very humble. Sometimes that's even more effective missionary work. Mm. This is so true. And eventually, I think uh, the, the deepest conviction, maybe some initial, initial positive impression might come because a person appears very confident and has all the answers. It might appeal to some people. But eventually, it is, it is how thoughtful, how caring a person is. That's what is going to endure, lead to an enduring spiritual connection. True. So we could see uh, there's uh, di discussion on these issues more as uh, so I want to go back to one point which I didn't address that you said that the world is not filled with demons. The world is uh, generally again there is this polarity of we and they, and I think that is an that is maybe an artifact of the time when we were a much more insular movement. So when I started reading uh, uh, about I mean, broadly outside our, our tradition, so I read one book by Houston Smith uh, about world religions. And he said that, you know, when we are exploring other religions, we start with two assumptions. He said, people everywhere are essentially like you. And people want to get on with the business of life. And they turn to religion as a resource for getting on with the business of life. So you know, I found that very striking that as you said, people want to take care of their family, have a job, be healthy and go on with the business of life. So how do we reconcile this with the idea say that this Kaluga and most people are degraded and there are divine nature and there's demoniac nature. So sometimes, sometimes some devotees not, not seen explicit quote Prabhupada would say sometimes if somebody is not a devotee, that means they are all demons. So, I, as I said, I have not read that quote. So, the idea that people out there are not evil or bad people, this itself requires a certain amount of uh, reconceptualization of Krishna consciousness. Because quite often in the initial days, there is a significant amount of fear that is created. I have to tell you something, Prabhu, and I, you know, I get into trouble when I talk like this. I know it, but I can't help myself. This image that people have of Srila Prabhupada as some kind of, um, you know, someone with a, a sledgehammer in his hand, you know, who, who's coming to, to smash demons, is the most harmful thing I think I can think of in our society. Yeah. It's um, it's embarrassing. Uh, uh, it's infuriating, and it's just plain wrong. There were times when Prabhupada was strong like that, and that was important. It was you know part of a certain ethos that he brought to his mission. But he wasn't training us to become a, you know, an army of disciplinarians. That, that's not why. He, he came. It's so it's uh, it's very saddening for me as someone who knew him and and spent time with him to think that people have this image. And I tell you truthfully, I think anyone who has this idea, this image of Prabhupada, as you know, the strong, strict disciplinarian out there, you know, to smash the demons, they have some serious psychological problems. You know, I mean, I, they might want to consider getting some therapy. Because that note, how on earth are you ever going to bring someone to Krishna consciousness if all you see is a world full of demons? I like what um, Carl Jung once said. He said, what if the worst of the offenders, the person who is most in need of correction, what if those people are all in need. What if I am the one who is most in need of my own concern? What then? That's us out there. That's not some Rakshasa horde. That's you and me. 
before Prabhupada came. I would just ask people to reconsider that strident position because frankly, I find it offensive. You know, this is one of the things which struck me when I read your book, Prabhu, that uh, how you, uh, Swami in a strange line, how you presented Prabhupada. It is also, I got a, a recent comment I was going to share with you. He says, uh, one devotee shared with me, you know, I feel I have fallen in love with Yogeshwar Prabhu's Prabhupada. I wish I had heard about this Prabhupada more than 10 years ago. So, this is beautiful. Uh, when I read, yes, I'll conclude with this point and just to add to this point. You know, when I read Radhanath Maharaj's journey home, you know, he devotes one full chapter on Prabhupada's song, Markine Bhagavad Dharma. And he described that song and he describes his reflection on that song. And in terms of the whole book, there is so much adventure in the whole book, but this is just meditation on one, one song. So then I started it struck me. I had read that song many times, but that was the time when I found so much he has devoted on so much space in that book has devoted in that one song that the picture of Prabhupada we have in that song is say very different from the picture we might get from a book like Life Comes From Life or a book like the Hare Krishna, the Hare Krishna Challenge or some other books like that. So that Prabhupada had so many different facets which, could, which can be so radically different. And what you said is that Prabhupada is that sometimes Prabhupada did that, but that was not Prabhupada most of the times. And Prabhupada's purpose was not to create an army of disciplinarians. That's quite a, I think for many of many devotees, it will be a significantly radical reconceptualization of who Prabhupada was. Because for many devotees, Prabhupada was like this, and occasionally he was, uh, you know, he was accommodating, he was. That was like a license for some times. But this is who Prabhupada was really. But what you're saying is almost like flipping the narrative. No better late than never. Yes, bro. <laughs> so I always enjoy my time with you. You challenge me. You challenge me to come. I would remember. say that. Yeah, I mean, it is. Uh, I really wish personally also that I had these dialogues maybe 10, 15 years ago. But Probably I wouldn't have benefited the, as much from them at that time as I would have now. So I'm very grateful for this dialogue, Prabhu. And should I try to quickly summarize? I don't want to take too much of your time. We, we went over a lot of topics. Uh, so we tried to discuss broadly the, is technology, is the say, technological development playing God? Is developing technology equivalent to playing God? So rather than getting into specific issues, you focused on that the point that we are not anti-science, we are not anti-technology. We have a whole philosophical underpinning for the use of technology, philosophical basis. What we are is anti-material. And, and when technology becomes, say, over... Prabhu, excuse me, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I would say, I would even adjust that somewhat. I don't think we're anti-material. Yeah, that is true. I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> that, I think we're, we're looking to, to manage things in society so that the material and the spiritual can cohabit peacefully. Oh, okay. So I think, you know, maybe we could say not even anti-material, it could be anti-materialistic or anti-hedonistic. Yeah. That, yeah. 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 So yeah. you said that you go with the example of, was it the World Science Congress where they were not ready to hear even the, uh, hear, can you hear about the idea of a non, uh, non-material perspective? For a transmaterial perspective for the World Science think, Festival. Yeah. World Science Festival, yeah. So rather than focusing on specific issues, the core theme was the culture around technology. Because rather than thinking that is this good or it is bad, you said it is here and it is real and it's not going to go away. So how can we direct the discussion around it? So, first point you made is it concerns us. Krishna consciousness is not just about identifiable devotional practices. I love that phrase that such as chanting and deity worship, but it's also about how we engage with the world in Krishna's service. And so these issues are going to concern us primarily because they will infringe into our life sooner or later. And also because our acharyas themselves wrote books, which indicates that 
they wanted to shape the future shape the future and engage with the broader world and so that's what we are, we should also be doing and then so the ethos with which technology is used the culture around the use of technology so how technology is how and why technology is developed and deployed so we discussed how at one level say <clears throat> when in the nazi germany the eugenics project developed that was developed based on inspiration from america and there have been horrendous misuses we talked about australia also a pandemic happened at that time in 1985 there in 1985 so technology is real and rather than thinking that uh, this is irrelevant to us that could be one extreme the other is that we have some definitive answers and everybody simply has to hear those answers from us we can use these issues to engage in the discussion and so you got the example of abhaktivan institute has uh, now uh, invited as one of the directors or advisors what was that that was asked to be join the board of directors join board of directors yeah so the idea is that we provide we pro- those who are pioneers those who are working in these fields uh, we provide them some uh, overall direction based on we become a resource for providing them that direction and when we are engaging in this the focus is not so much on the outcome as on the process that by engaging in the discussion we become a part of the we get a place on the table and then people want to get, people get to know about us so rather than trying to convert them to our definitive understanding it is more that through our interactions we get them to increase their receptivity and curiosity for krishna consciousness and one way of doing this also is that basically entering into the dialogue we can go back to your point about say hollywood movies which have sci-fi themes quite often the science in them is uh, is they're not really scientific science can sci- they're too fantastic but that can be a good discussion point to get people to uh, dis- to consider say some more spiritual perspectives we talked about augmented intelligence and then overall general intelligence or artificial, artificial general intelligence which is much more elusive well so then one very significant point when i raise the issue about uh, you know as do a we as a movement will we have some positions on certain issues we said it is more of uh, we don't want to become like a totalitarian institute because that's a danger rather the truth is not just uh, locked in stone but truth is a living breathing experience so it's in the mahajan vina gata dharan se tatvam nihitam guhayam so if we if we can educate devotees and offer educational resources for the for the broader world then individuals can come up to their own decisions and that way uh, we will be empowering individ- empowering devotees and individuals to to develop their relationship with krishna and contribute in terms of their unique non duplicable uh, relationship in this world and then towards the end you mentioned about how uh, when we are in, when we are trying to engage in a dialogue with people we have to we have a more humble and respectful attitude not that we have the answers and all of them are demons rather that prabhupad by prabhupad is portrayed like that that is a mis- misrepresentation of prabhupad you now prabhupad was is that you know he was humble he was loving and what people care of is not so much our position on particular issues but on who we are as human beings so sometimes in trying to be ideal vaishnavas we forget to be normal human beings and what people need in the world today is this i allowed the statement that the essence of preaching uh, is actually to become somebody's friend so that people can people see us as a trustworthy person whom they can open up to and that way we can have more you could say more deeper and sustainable a transformation of the heart and a reorient reconnection of people with krishna you like to add any last words prabhu no, as always you do an extraordinary job of summarizing the long complex conversation thank you very much prabhu like this thank you thank you it's wonderful talking with you thank you prabhu hari bol hari krishna